Okay. Well, welcome everyone to our Facebook Live today. Great that you can have joined us. I hope you're having a bit of lunch and uh, maybe keeping out of some of the colder weather that's currently sweeping up the South Island. So in light of, um, it's certainly winter time and a, and a busy week last week and this week onwards for getting onto winter crop, we thought we'd run a bit of a session today with regard to, uh, well, stepping onto winter crops from a pasture-based diet for the ruminant species out there. Many of you already have this underway, but we thought it was an opportunity to, to dive into some of the issues or hopefully not issues that you see. And to support that, first I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Charlotte Westwood. I'm a vet and nutritionist with PGG Rights and Seeds. Uh, importantly, co-hosting today is another person uh, very well known to many of you in the industry, Wayne Nicol. Uh, Wayne, I'll pass over to you to give an intro for those of you that haven't met you before. Thanks, Charlotte. Yep, um, just like Charlotte with PG Rocks and Seeds, um, covering the um, country and um, involved in the agronomy and nutrition side of things. So, thanks, Charlotte. Oh, thanks, Wayne. Well, well, look, to kick off, I guess, um, firstly, some of the, um, the thought, things that we thought we'd cover, but please do feel free to, to add in um, any comments or let us know other stuff you'd like us to talk about. But firstly and foremost, it's really, we are at the start of winter. I suppose this is day four officially of winter and very conscious that for many of you around the country, um, including your part of the world where you're based uh, in Otago through into South and there, Wayne, has been a very challenging year. And on that basis, a lot of the ways that we normally advocate, this is how we should do on crop, potentially isn't available to us, whether your feed budget isn't quite lining up, you don't have the typical amounts of supplements on hand that you may have in, in other years, and perhaps your crop yields aren't, or are where they are um, versus other years. I mean, Otago Southland Wayne, starting off with you, how's, how's it looked? Um, we talked last about this back in April. How have things moved along since then? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess the crop yields are, are down. Um, I was actually just reading in one of the local uh, magazines, they're talking up to 40% across the region. So that's obviously going to have a significant impact. Um, a lot of that's just a straight out result of the cold spring we had. Um, mm. A lot of late crops, a lot of crop failures. Um, and of course, we had the flooding event as well, just the make things a little bit worse. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess in terms of crop yields, um, yes, they are down. I guess the one noticeable thing that we are seeing is a huge variability in dry matter percentage on the crop. So it's the old adage, you, you don't know what you don't know unless you get it measured. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the flip, <clears throat> flip side of all that is that we are getting very good utilisation and very little wastage. I mean, it has been reasonably mild. Um, frosts have arrived in a lot of regions. so. On the flip side, yes, the crops are down, but to date, although Albert uh, today is not so flash, but um, has been generally pretty good. Yeah, we'll take that additional utilisation is a good win um, for the moment anyway. So in terms of yielding, I know a lot of people were out there um, basically as soon as level four finished and were doing some preemptive yields. Um, it's probably a good reason to still continue to do some yields, you know, starting firstly on the areas that you are transitioning onto because, wow, what a difference a slight yield variation will make, particularly transitioning onto some of the higher risk crops, notably fodderbeet. What else would you recommend, Wayne? Yeah, we, so we start with re-measuring the um, crops. We certainly get a lot of interest and a lot of questions around that every year. Um, when, how often we should measure them. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, as I said, it's been reasonably mild and we've certainly put on quite a bit of yield on a lot of the crops, even in the last four weeks. And um, even if we set as much as 50 kilos a day, you multiply that out over that time period. Well, that's quite a significant gain, not only on a, a hectare basis, but you, um, you multiply it across hectares. And well, that's quite a significant jump in yield and ongoing as well. So not all crops are equal across the paddock. And um, if we are going to go right through uh, July, August, September, well, we get quite a bit of variability. So yes, it is justified um, reweighing them. I guess the only thing that um, I would say to that is, yes, kale, for example, might put on yield, but the flip side of that is we get lignification on the stem. So we actually lose um, some of our utilis um, utilizable feeds. You end up pretty much at the same point. I guess one of the big risks is, of course, the bulb crops when you lose leaf. So. Potentially, yes, it is worthwhile just double checking what you do have. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so in terms of supplements, I mean, obviously the crops, you know, the key driver for the majority of our crop-based systems through the winter. What about um, supplements? Certainly you've heard, we've all heard of um, some real challenges this year with regard to getting that, that long stem fibre, the high physically effective fibre feeds that we need to be feeding with our, our crops. What are you hearing in terms of the amount of supplement on the ground um, and or other strategies that people are looking for to try and fill that gap of supplements to try and get that, that balance right? Yeah, dead right. So along with the um, crops being late getting in, of course, you don't get much um, pasture growth while you're going through those wet events as well. So there's a, a lot less silage available. Um, we've certainly seen a lot of trucks on the road bringing down from Canterbury, uh, a little bit like the North Island, um, the transfer of hay and straw, um, just to provide that fibre source. Um, alongside that, we are getting questions, um, as I'm sure you are, in regards to well, what is the minimum amount of supplement I need to feed? If, if I've got adequate crop yields, then how much fibre do I actually need to go with it? And it's probably something I'll throw to you. Yeah, well, I mean, I think everyone's aware that it's essentially the, um, the requirements of our different stock classes can be used to our advantage or understanding those requirements used to our advantage in the year this year where we're going to slice and dice our limited supply of baleage or, or straw that you do have available. In, in the ideal world, and this, this year has been the year to throw the textbook out to some degree, um, but in the ideal world, for example, for sheep, we still would like um, sheep to have perhaps 10% of their diet as a, a fibre source. So for use on crop in the ideal world, it's nice for them to have access to a bit of baleage. Um, in, in the less than ideal world that we're operating in this year, if you need to rejig uh, your diet uh, and you've got mixed stock classes, perhaps of uh, poggets, mixed age ewes, beef cattle, and maybe you've got some dairy grazers on as well. With regard to um, your mixed age use would be the first stock class that you could boundary push a little further with regard to feeding a higher proportion of crop um, once transitioned and reducing that amount of baleage or indeed having no baleage at all. That's not ideal, uh, but if you've got use in good condition, uh, if necessary, they can handle 100%, uh, let's say, Swede diet uh, if we need to go there. But that's in regards to prioritisation of the forage that otherwise went to the mixed age used towards another stock class. That could be uh, inland hoggets that we can talk about a bit later with specific requirements for them. But the, the top of the list of in priorities of the stock that do have a requirement for a long stem forage source is cattle. I would not ever advocate, even in a year this year, like we have this year, to be feeding 100% of the diet as, as a winter crop for cattle. They do importantly have a requirement for forage um, between 20 to 30% of the diet on a dry matter basis once transitioned. So we're jumping ahead a little here, but cattle will, will not, <laughs> I've, I've, once I've seen um, beef cattle on 100% sweet diet a number of years ago, and they just did not look well, um, very tucked up in the gut. And at the end of the day, I'm, you know, if you've got a slice and dice, who gets what? Cattle still need 20 to 30% of the diet as a long stem forage with regard to maintaining good room and function, but also diluting down some aspects of winter crops that um, fed at 100% of the diet to cattle isn't ideal, for example, the risk of rumen acidosis. The other thing with um, cattle is that when we have adverse weather events, you know, the first real southerly storm comes through, we have a real high importance for keeping those cattle warm with the heat of fermentation in the rumen. And if they don't have a long stem fibre source in there, they will be more prone to the effects of an adverse weather event. So there's a range of reasons. Um, and we do have, uh, you know, the real spotlight on winter cropping this year. Uh, and we've got to do these, these particularly the cattle um, right with regard to fibre sources. I guess uh, probably just um, the other th uh, feed sources that we are seeing, um, and it's not, obviously not the fibre source, but things like grain um, going into sheep um, to keep them going, especially um, uh, through the mating period, we've seen quite a bit of grain go out. Um, on the dairy side, those that have got the ability to do it, palm kernel extract uh, or palm kernel extract mixes, PKE, um, but that's obviously a challenge in the middle of winter um, to do. Um, and I guess further on, um, we will, if things stay tight, we'll start to see in the um, sheep front, uh, sheep nuts will certainly come on the radar as well, depending on how the winter goes. So while things are reasonably mild, we still got good utilisation, things are going mm -hmm. reasonably well, but if the weather deteriorates, we suspect that uh, yeah, we will be looking at other sources of feed if we can get to it. 
Yeah, palm kernel. Well, I mean, as you say, you know, and say for cattle again, I guess we're coming back to with, with dairy cattle is, you know, utilisation has been magnificent um, up until now, you know, and, and we may still see some windows of, of good utilisation that, that you could put some palm kernel um, into dry dairy cows while you still can get on the crop just to substitute the demand on baleage. But clearly, whilst we say that at the moment, while utilisation is good, we're also, for most um, guys on crop at the moment, just starting into transitioning or, or maybe a weekend or so. And palm kernel, whilst it is a high NDF or neutral detergent fibre source, that's not the physically effective source we need to maintain room and function. So you couldn't, for example, drip through transitioning um, where you may be looking at over half or more of the diet to be supplement, substitute your baleage or straw out entirely, but perhaps that's a shandying effect that then defers your demand on your baleage and, and maybe hay or straw further into the winter when otherwise you couldn't get out there with palm kernel trailers um, that you've got, you've got to your runoff. So there's no, what you're saying, Wayne, there's no recipe for success here, is there? Um, it's just everyone's different. With regard to the sheep side of it, I mean, it was really neat actually to see people investing um, through tupping in that first sort of month after the rams had, had done their biz, um, some sheep nuts and, and feeding because well, those people that have done it, I know that the pain of paying for that at the time, you're certainly increasing you condition and everything that's over a good solid three is less pressure on you to keep, to get that condition on um, and maintain everything over a three through the winter, mainly because you've invested in getting the condition now. So um, well done to those that took the courage to, uh, you know, to talk to the bank manager and, and get some, some good feed supplies out there for yous. And then again, that consideration to do that again, if you need to, uh, you know, basically went once you're um, you're back onto pasture at the other end of winter. So it's, it is an investment, but it's it's a dollar spent now to to hopefully get a dollar or two dollars or more back in terms of new condition through lambing and then then obviously um, survivability and performance uh, of the newborn lamb, which is where the dollars are going to be. Definitely, definitely. Um, I guess the um... The other thing that um, we are seeing in the field, Charlotte, and again, you might have some comment on this, um, a few of the crops have, particularly in the brassicas, have started uh, flowering. Um, and we've also got some, um, a lot of talk around nitrate poisoning as well, but certainly the flowering issue in kale, which is a straight out a, a consequence of uh, when that plant was a seedling, it's been vernalized at some stage and it's sent it into, into seed. And I guess the question has been posed um, down here is, well, can I feed the flowering crop? What are the risks? And should I feed it now or later? And I've always been a fan, if it's flowering now, certain if it's pockets of the paddock, you feed that first. Um, main reason being that obviously if we've got pregnant animals further on, their intakes are only gonna go up. Um, they're at greater risk. But um, any thoughts around the, um, the flowering um, brassica thing in particular? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, Wayne. I mean, there's always that question, um, you know, do you, do you smash into it now? Um, ironically, when stock are transitioning, and, you know, you, you may be scratching your head thinking if that's a good idea while you're transitioning, but always had the, the philosophy of if you've got something flowering now due to an earlier frost, got the attitude of use it or lose it. So obviously, once a, a plant's decided to go reproductive, it just it doesn't look back. It just keeps on going. It'll, um, as you say, the stem will lignify and harden off, so there goes your utilisation. Um, and when it's throwing its energy up into the reproductive pl uh, plant parts, then so you're losing all the leaf as well. So the, the overall ME, the, the energy of the plant will be lost. So use it or lose it from an from a energy point of view. Clearly, I guess, putting my, my vet animal health hat on, uh, we do have you know some concerns around a uh, flowering or, or close to flowering kale plant. And pretty well everyone knows of, of that risk that we call it. There's a number, number of different terms, S, SMCO toxicity. Uh, another term, kale anemia, red water, there's a range of different terms that we, we describe that is um, largely largely specific to kale and flowering kale. And for sure, that's, that's, that is a small risk. But at Wayne, as you said, a cow now who may be two to three months away from calving, two things. One is that she's eating less of her overall body weight as a percentage of, of um, you know, in terms of her dry matter intake. So the net intake of, of crop now is going to be relatively less than, than later. Clearly, if you are transitioning now, we have got a dilution effect with your supplements, perhaps um, running them on and off back onto pasture, you know, and on average through transition, I guess at least half, if not more of the diet will be coming from another feed source as part of your transitioning. So um, you are diluting down the intake of that, that flour and crop if you choose to eat it now. But notwithstanding that, there still remains a small risk 
at the moment we don't have a fee testing lab that routinely will offer SNCO testing for you. So it's a little bit of a measured risk, but all we can say is don't let hungry cattle um, onto each daily break of that flour and kale. Make sure that you're feeding supplement first, which is what you'll be doing. This is all, you know, standard stuff that I know um, those of you have done this for a long time, nothing new there. Probably the key thing is when we talk about nitrate, and we can come back to that if you'd like, but um, we talk about nitrate cattle with gradual um, transition and great care, cattle will um, go through a rumen adaptation phase to nitrate. Unfortunately, the reverse is true for SMCO, despite all the, the tender loving care of careful transitioning animals um, and cattle specifically we're talking about here won't, trend, won't, won't adapt, um, rumen adapt to SMCO, so the risk will still remain um, irrespective of how carefully you transition. The other difference if you're transitioning onto a flowering crop would be um, that clinical disease usually, and, and everyone that is in the business of this knows that most of the problems we see during transitioning with regard to risk of rubin acidosis and um, brassica bloat and some of those other nutritionally mediated diseases tend to happen during that first two, two weeks to three weeks. Fodder beak particularly, you know, that, that second week when they really start getting into the bulbs. Unlike that with SMCO toxicity, the problems we see clinically there's usually, oddly enough, between three to five weeks after they start onto uh, a flower and kale crop or, or a leafy crop that happens to have high levels of SMCO. And that's to do with the fact that we get damage to the red blood cells caused by the breakdown product of SMCO. And cows, just like us, respond to that by um, pushing more red cells out of the circulation from their spleen and then start manufacturing new red cells from the bone marrow. And poor old cows, they'll do a valiant job of that and eventually they'll exhaust those backup plans for keeping her red blood cell count high and it's usually that um, three to five weeks after they start onto a high SMCO crop that you start to see some clinical problems of red water which is when they urinate um, red, red coloured urine out. Sometimes you may, unless you see them urinating that, you may not be aware of that and you'll simply see some red staining around the vulva uh, that obviously makes you suspect perhaps she's slipped or lost a pregnancy but that's just something to think about if you have got um, that, that decision to, to get into some of um, your kale if it had started flowering now. But on with Wayne summing that up, um, go hard, go early on that early and, and take it out because um, it's just going to get worse um, as the winter progresses. So it, it's an interesting query, Wayne, that you'd had from um, someone out in the field um, earlier this week. I guess the... Um... I think it comes back to though outside of SMCO, and I think one of the misnomers about SMCO they don't adapt, but a lot of the other ones like acidosis, uh, nitrate poisoning, it just emphasises that that transition, that slow introduction of that high quality crop, whatever it might be, um, helps mitigate those effects. It's just the straight out uh, dilution, but also the buffering effect in the rumen as well helps dilute a lot of those effects. So it just re-emphasises that A, that we need to build up your intake slowly, but um, of course, that we've always got to have that fibre source slash uh, roughage always in the um, diet right throughout winter, um, right the way through. And yeah. I guess that raises another interesting point, Charlotte. So if we do have a, a serious event, uh, like a heavy rainfall, heavy snow, we are forced to um, take them off, put them on pasture and feed them more silage. Do we have to retransition them back on to that high quality crop? after a period of time, if they have been off for a, a significant period, say of two, three days? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, Wayne. And, and this year of all years, you know, I know as an industry, um, there's so many people talking about, you know, we've really got to get this right, um, you know, to because we don't really want to see the, the social media images being splashed around. So the emphasis is going to be very much on forecasting to get cattle um, um, particularly use pre um, shorn, shorn um, off crop and seeking shelter is probably the key thing to reduce uh, wind chill factors. So in many cases that will necessitate, as you say, re total removal of stock from the forage crops, whether that be a winter brassica or fodder beet, um, for the duration of that, that uh, weather event before they can go back on crop. The question, and it comes every year, is how long can they be off crop before we have to restart that whole heartbreaking transition thing all over again. And I'd love to say I know definitely how long, um, but I don't, to be honest. The rule of thumb would be, in the absence of any other information, is if 
uh, at an, the necessity to make sure from a welfare point of view, you sort shelter for your stock that they're, um, if they've been off for more than 48 to 72 hours, I'd be starting to wonder about being a little bit careful about then going back to the crop once, once the weather's gone through. The 48 to 72 hours is, is, a, is kind of a ballpark figure. Uh, if, for example, at the lesser end of the risk, you had removed uh, mixed age dairy cows from a kale-based diet, maybe they were half kale, half supplement. If after two to three days, you return them to a half kale, half supplement based diet, I'd be reasonably comfortable, provided they go back to the kale with a good belly full of supplements first, that you could probably crack into that, um, maybe just go quarter of a diet kale for a couple of days and then half and you'd be away again. The other end of the spectrum with regard to risk might be your fodder beet feeder. Again, a mixed age dairy cow is a high risk stock class. And you may be, uh, you've adopted that system where you feed very high rates of fodder beet, uh, just with a little bit of fiber. Now, if those girls had been off that fodder beet for more than certainly a third day, I would um, strongly recommend considering uh, undertaking some form of transition not to the same extent as what probably what you're working through now to get them on at the beginning of winter, but considering um, maybe two to three days of two to three kilos of dry matter um, of fodder beet a couple of days at that and then stepping back up. So the more extreme um, wintering system, which typically would be fodder beet with not much supplement, uh, the more careful you'll have to be stepping animals back onto crop after you've had them off for two to three days in order to seek sh a shelter with an adverse weather event. If, if in doubt, transition, but accepting that this is a very challenging year with not a lot of supplementary feed available for particularly South Otago, Southland. I guess following on from that, I mean, we are um, probably well within the first week, getting on to the second week, as you say. Um, we are getting up to full intakes now. Um, potentially those risks are, are probably at their maximum. Um, in terms of some of those intake. Um, so I'll hand it back to you, but what's some practical uh, visual things we should be looking for um, in terms of the daily shift? What sort of things can we look for in the animals themselves that uh, might be some giveaways that um, things aren't 100% or, or are working at 100%? Yeah, absolutely. I know a lot of people that may be watching this, um, this is a little bit of granny sucking eggs or whatever, um, fully respect that you know, some amazing stockmanship um, skills out there. I suppose this is more targeted perhaps at um, younger members of your team or uh, new entrants to the industry, uh, accepting some staffing issues out there at the moment with visas and the closed borders. But essentially, when you're really busy um, managing stock on crop, you can be very, very busy and sometimes not see the wood for the trees. So try and make yourself a little bit of time. And it may be when you arrive at, um, at the paddock in the morning, um, essentially to, to feed out baleage and silage uh, and then potentially shift them onto a fresh breaker crop. Is first, before I sort of rip in and look at the individual cows, is just look at the, the mob uh, as a whole. And obviously you're looking for those ones that are hanging back from their mates um, and not necessarily interacting as well as they should be, particularly for recently dried off dairy cows, those that may physically look unwell and, and particularly thinking despite dry cow or, or teat seal, um, perhaps there could be a mastitis risk going on there in those first few, uh, well, the first couple of weeks on crop particularly, just those early dry period cases of mastitis. So looking if there's any animals that are away from the rest of their mates um, and pets hanging out around stock water, uh, could be just wondering a little bit at room and acidosis if they're looking for water. Um, those that are hanging around inappropriately too much around the supplements and not onto the crop. And then we, I suppose, step in closer, Wayne, and start just be really quietly looking at the individual uh, animals, just in terms of, of how they're presenting to you, looking for cows, whether we've got some issues about hair really on end over the withers, um, looking unwell in terms of general coat presentation, just looking a bit rough through that transition period, even, even with the first southerly, the coats can look a bit rough. Gut fill, if particularly during transition, we're a little concerned about some rumen acidosis. Uh, you may not necessarily look that every single anim individual animal is very tucked up and, and a low rumen score. So in other words, a score of, um, of one to five, how full the rumen is or not, but looking for variation. Quite often if we have during transition, a proportion of animals love 
um, going back to the bale feeders and, and hogging into the supplements, yet others conversely are hooking into the crop. You'll see quite a variation in rumen score. You'll see some that uh, are full as and plenty of cud chewing going on and very content. And then on the other hand, looking perhaps across 20 cows all pointing in the same direction and looking similarly, you've got others that are very tucked up and even hunched a little. Um, that I'd term them the crop junkies, even though on average, um, a week into transition, you may have half of the diet being offered as supplement and half being offered as crop. You've got those crop junkies, particularly the, the sweet tooth sugar junkies on fodder bank who love their beet. Uh, and they may be consuming 12 or even 14 kilos of fodder beet and, 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 and perhaps none, no supplement. If you've got a limited number of bale feeders, sometimes that's the submissive cows. They're not actually the crop junkies, but the dominant cows won't let, let them near the bale feeders and the only thing they can access is crops. So there's a lot of um, social dynamics within a mob of cattle um, that need, especially during this first couple of weeks, if mobs have been mixed up, a lot of cows are missing their mates. They do have quite strong social bonds. They're looking for them. They're not competing for forage or they are competing for forage. Um, a lot can be can be learned. And it's, it's tough to find the time because you're so busy doing other stuff on and off the tractor and shifting brakes to stop and look. But have a real good look at how that social dynamic is working and who's not competing, particularly R2 heifers. You know, we've all mouthed those R2 heifers and we know that some of them are, are cutting not only the, um, the middle incisors, you know, they sort of come through sideways and then, then twist and turn around. At the same time, those middle bottom incisors are coming through, they're doing their pre molders as well. And we're always looking for those girls on crop um, with a readiness to, to flick the ones out that just aren't competing. And if they're a little bit drooly in the mouth and not looking too well, particularly on bulb crops, we're looking for those too. Um, always keen once you've, you've um, opened up a, the new break for the day to make sure that face is long enough for everyone to get shoulder to shoulder and have a good feed, that the dominant cows aren't swinging heads and, and popping the submissive cows out the back so that they're not competing for crop, the crop face. Um, making sure stock water's keeping up, making sure there's no evidence that, that you've got any, any girls that are leaning on the standards, you know, that have been bent forward and they've been pushing it forward to get their heads under. Just, it's, as I say, you know, you guys have done this for a long time, you know all this intuitively. So really it's about, again, you're busy trying to spend some time with, with the new, new people on farm. You know, maybe you've got some townies that have, um, you know, lost jobs in town and, and come out um, for the first time. Do, do invest time um, just in that stockmanship side of it because you've got the skills and, and do do share all your tips and tricks um, with your team members. Is there anything, Wayne, that you'd look for? I know I come out as a vet and you come out as an agronomist. What would you be looking for? Um, good crop based management. I think that's one of the things you picked up on. Um, we've got to make sure all animals have got access at the same time. We, we do all the work in terms of measuring the crop and doing the correct allocation, but if we haven't got the correct face size or length, um, then we do get that issue, particularly with cattle, where we get dominant cows at the front and submissive at the back. And that's probably another good point. If an animal's standing back and not eating at all, then um, it's one of those ones where you've just better to drag it right off altogether because it's it's never going to eat it. They just You get the odd ones sometimes that don't take. But good crop face management, nice straight lines, plenty of power on the fence. Um, certainly consider back fencing. Um, that stops them uh, wandering to a certain extent, um, creating mud. And of course, we've got some environmental concerns now that mm -hmm. we have to consider as well. And I'd seriously consider um, having a, a face in front of the face, just in case we do get those breakouts, particularly with those bulb crops that um, are most at risk of things like acidosis, but also the um, risk associated with the other crops with nitrate. Um, and as you say, keeping the water up to the face as well. Um, they certainly will drink water. Um, yes, the crop does have a lot of water, but it's not much point if it's frozen. And I guess that's probably another point to throw to you. We are getting some pretty heavy frost down this end of the world. I think it was a minus seven the other morning. She was fairly cold. Ooh. So um, I've always been a personal believer that you should feed after the, uh, shift the break after the frost, feed the solids in the morning. Would that be fair, Paul Charlotte? Yeah, and again, those that have fed crop for a long time know all this stuff um, without a doubt, but essentially, a frozen um, plant, you know, like a kale plant, for example, but hey, frozen breaks of grass, anything that's frozen, we've got, we've got a greater risk of, of both um, bloat, which we can talk about um, if we need to, uh, but also acidosis as well, particularly on our crops, uh, but also, you know, it could happen on a, a frozen, um, if it's a low yielding oat, 
green, cereal green feed or anything else, but essentially because it's frozen twofold, one, because it's wet and frozen, and we'll talk on cattle as being the greater risk of um, tipping up uh, eating frozen crop, is that they don't have to produce much saliva to eat it. It's very, very, it's cold, but it's also very wet. So they can eat it really quickly without adding a lot of saliva. So during this transition period, the frozen crop will certainly accentuate risk of rumen acidosis or low rumen pH because they're not putting the buffers in with the saliva because it's so wet and easy for them to consume. The other aspect, and, and this is the high probability, you know, a little bit of science around it, is that the frozen plant matter, um, the, the plant cells are more fragile. So when the animal chews it and swallows it and drops it into the nice warm um, 40 degree environment inside the rumen, those cells break down more quickly than with a non-frozen plant material. And that increases risk of rumen acidosis and brassica, um, black brassica bloke, um, particularly uh, with regard to the frozen material. So yes, experienced people know this very, very well, but new entrants to the industry may not be aware that we've really, really got to wait um, for that frost to come off the crop. And so you're feeding out your supplements and going away and doing another job or, you know, grabbing some late breakfast or whatever and coming back. It's always challenging on overcast days, sometimes those really bleak days where we have frost and then fog rolls in or it stays overcast and remains frozen. So just be on alert that if you do have to shift when uh, it's still frozen, um, that that could be a, a slightly increased risk of acidosis, which will be more relevant this year when potentially out of feed budget requirements, you might not be feeding quite as much long stem fiber as normally you would like to be doing. So it's certainly the year uh, to be doing that. So yeah, big shout out to the people that know this already. Uh, we know you know that, but just spread the word a bit further now that now that the weather and winter is truly upon us. Yes, we've focused a lot on the um, fodder beet and the brassica side, Charlotte, but um, going further north where it has been very dry, um, they have received a, lot, a bit of moisture now. Um, we are seeing some fresh uh, pasture growth. Um, and the other question I've certainly had raised in recent times is uh, the use of cereals that were planted uh, extra out just to generate some feed. Any um, thought processes around feeding those pasture slash um, cereal crops in terms of um, animal side of things? I've certainly got some thoughts on the pasture side, but from the animal side? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll put it back to you because I think the pasture side of it for the greater good of the whole farm business is, is the more important, but specifically for the animals um, in terms of keeping them fit and well, um, you know, there's been a lot of coverage this autumn about the risk of nitrate toxicity coming out of a drought year, a lot of uh, mineralisation that's occurred through such a mild autumn that we've had. Um, and now we've had some moisture, notwithstanding in some areas here that it's going quite cold now, um, but anything that's recovering um, from the post dry, particularly uh, Italians or annuals that you've um, late sown um, and then into, as you say, green feed cereals, specifically oats. Uh, that mineralized nitrogen is, is sitting around as nitrate around the plant roots. And when we finally get that little bit of growth that we've been so desperately waiting for, nitrate is a real risk. So I can't stand in a paddock with you and say whether this is gonna be a nitrate risky paddock or not. So if in doubt, test. Obviously, it's a longer turnaround time, but it's still quantitatively the best to get a result from a feed testing lab, or at the very least, drop a sample into uh, your local vets or pick up a kit from the vets and do your own test on farm. We call that sort of semi-quantitative. It's not quite as accurate as the vets, but extremely worthwhile, much better than not knowing whether it's um, risky for nitrate or not. So um, yeah, you must test. You can't, you can't manage what you don't measure with that nitrate risk. Um, a lot of the recovering grass and, and some of the shorter green feed cereal crops will be very lush and very soft. So again, this is that issue around rumen acidosis for cattle, less so uh, for, for um, perhaps for hoggets or, or mixed age ewes um, heading into the winter. But, but yeah, essentially um, low fibre. And then one other aspect, and we were talking with our friends at Owl Farm, um, St Peter's at Cambridge, and they have an area of uh, forage oats in and they just posted on their Facebook page um, some feed test results from their forage oats after we were talking last week about very low magnesium in forage oats and calcium for that matter but specifically for the old farm dry cows we just talked about the potential requirement for magnesium on these uh, recovering pastures mainly because it squirts through the guts really quick and the magnesium can't be absorbed very efficiently but wow green feed oats are very low in magnesium and calcium so just something where 
as you say, Wayne, that you know people have um, chased feed them, rightly so, um, with green feed cereal if you have got um, cows going onto that, particularly in the case of like our farm, they've got some heavily in calf cows going onto that. You may be looking at bringing forward your magnesium supplementation requirements for that green feed cereal um, compared to what normally you do in a normal year. But that's the animals. I think back to you, Wayne, because most importantly, our permanent pastures uh, that have now, thankfully, for most of New Zealand, and, and I hope everyone uh, has had a you know good drop of rain. Oh, it's so tempting, isn't it, when you finally get some grass ahead of you to go chasing that green pick. Um, I know you have concerns about that from the pastures point of view, Wayne. Yeah, you'd be dead right. I mean, it's exactly the same as a summer drought. We, we, we effectively had a long, long, long drought. Um, the, the root system on the pastures are depleted. Um, that initial regrowth that we're getting back, that's trying to lay down sugar to produce leaf. Um, until we get leaf, we can't replenish what's below ground. So my real concern, and I certainly was sent some photos yesterday of pastures already starting to pull. And pulling is a result of a combination of factors, but certainly having a very weak root system in combination with a soil that has no moisture, there's just some, nothing to hold that plant in the ground. So what we don't want to do, and it's, it's almost the same as the animal world, we're trying to do the best uh, of a situation that we've been put into, but we're trying to protect next season's production. And certainly on the pasture point of view, um, pulling plants, well, we can't do anything to rectify that to at least spring. And even if we do, we've got that time lag before it, it builds back up again to what it was producing. So certainly um, looking after those pastures would be a very good um, thing to do. I know it's not easy, but it's just um, it's just trying to make the best. Again, the other thing I picked up on um, in your discussion was when we look at things like green feed oats and Italians, they should be just treated like um, the other crops. We should be quantifying those. We should be measuring them for dry matter. I think you mentioned before you even had saw some of those type of um, pastures and cereals that are below the 10% mark, for example, for dry matter. So we think we've got feed there, but it may not necessarily be the case. So again, quantifying it and then break feeding it so we can control animal intakes, but also gain the benefit of regrowth behind them. So hence, again, the comment around back fencing as well. Yeah, very much so. I mean, the irony is, um, unfortunately for many people, in the drier regions of New Zealand have been feeding a, a lot of supplement um, and very sensitive to that, but it's, it's been a very long summer and autumn. And of course, the first thing you do want to do is crack into your green feed that's recovering. But even some, normally, um, I wouldn't sort of necessarily advocate a, a need for transitioning onto green feed cereals. But if you're coming off high rates of supplement, you will have a requirement to transition off feeding a lot of baleage and maybe palm kernel and everything else that you've been feeding. So do treat it just as risky as some of the other crops, particularly if you know or suspect that it's high nitrate. Uh, you know, the rumen of ruminants is a very forgiving thing that will allow animals to adjust to high levels of nitrate, but that'll take a good 10 to 14 days. So that's part of the transition process. So whilst green feed oats might look like, uh, like a big chunky grass, and you think it's relatively benign and safe, just a couple, you know, the lowest level of NDF uh, on a green feed cereal of, um, was 28% NDF, which is remarkably low. Um, and, you know, you can get rumen acidosis, particularly if it's starting to get cold and the sugar levels in those oats are starting to push up. So gradual adaptation. And as well, you know, if you haven't done for nitrate, at least gradual adaptation covers a lot of risk factors in young stock gradual adaptation. Um, together with, good, with a good vaccination program will, will reduce risk of um, clostridial disease and, and hoggets and yielding cattle and a whole lot of other things as well. So gradual transition, you know, is important for a whole raft of reasons, but accepting it's a tough year when they do eat you out of house and home through transition, you know, by consuming a lot of your hard, hard won and hard um, budgeted supplements. But majority of our illnesses and deaths in animals going on to winter feeds are during, is during that transition period. So, you know, if you're going to just relax a little bit more, try and relax a little bit more um, after that second to third week, and third week definitely for fodder beet, um, notwithstanding it's hard work now, but that will repay, um, you, you know, your investment in, in time now. So make sure you do look after yourself and have a little bit of a break later in June and early July, um, best you can once transition's done. We've probably covered quite a bit already, Charlotte, I guess probably just to wind up, and it seems kind of ironic, but we probably, for a lot of dairy boys in particular, we're only, um, in fact, in a lot of cases, less than two months out from sending cows mm. in the opposite direction. So the other question is, is 
well, what's the story about retransition when we go back the other way, bearing in mind some of these cows may be heading home back to crop um, or back to um, silage-based diets? Is, is there a need there again as that transition story comes back up again? Is there a greater need uh, at the other end as there are, is up front? Oh yeah, and that's a, that's another good one, Wayne. Um, and I know there'll be a lot of um, a lot of opinions out there in industry around this. I guess um, it's for us, you know, to understand from from a purist's point of view, which isn't always what translates into practical in the real world. But if we look at the extreme of wintering that really pushes, and I'll pick on cows again, mixed age dairy cows, because they tend to be the the more vulnerable high risk stock species for transitioning off crop. The extreme scenario for them would be uh, being fed very high rates of fodder beet. And I know Dairy NZ it will be coming out strongly advocating against feeding high rates of fodder beet, but that's another story another day. Um, if cows are being fed high rates of fodder beet, and then perhaps in, in some of the further south wintering systems that you work with Wayne, and as you say, they're coming off the high rates of fodder beet straight home maybe straight into the springer mob, um, being fed almost entirely a baleage-based diet or a silage-based diet. When you think about it, the type of fermentation that those um, cattle have been evolving in their rumens is very much adapted to a low fiber, high sugar diet. And the types of bacteria um, that are able the, um, to digest the cellulose and hemicellulose in a very fibrous diet like silage, they're simply not there. And we do find that cows that come home at, can struggle um, and lose condition when they first come on to a high rate of silage in the springer paddock so, or, or on a um, calving pad. So in the, in the ideal, and this is not necessarily the ideal, really this is where a lot of farmers are seeing very good success with bringing uh, cattle home to, to either fodder beet, but only as a small percentage of a diet, maybe it's been lifted, uh, and then settling them in for seven to 10 days and then drafting the spring of all from there uh, onto a grass-based or, or baleage-based diet. But there certainly appear to be some benefits to transitioning off the other end um, so that cows don't go from a high rate, perhaps of 10 to 12 kilos of fodder beets straight into a carving pad of um, close to 100% baleage. I suppose we have to say from a people point of view, now we're confused, we're transitioning on, and now you're suggesting Charlotte you transition off. I still think the, the main benefits are to be had are transitioning on, because that clearly is where the majority of illness and deaths occur, particularly high risk crops like fodder beet, but notwithstanding the brassicas sometimes as well. Um, transitioning off at the other end, ideally if you could step off more gradually uh, through pasture and then onto baleage yes but notwithstanding that can make a real big hole in your feed budget and drop your average pasture cover so whilst you might have transitioned nicely if you're carving down onto an 1800 um, cover well that clearly that's disastrous for early lactation and then through to peak lactation feeding so if it's something that you've wondered about and you're not set up to do it this year I wouldn't suggest you go and do it this year but maybe talk to you know uh, if you contract milking or, or uh, share, share milking, talk to the owner, um, get your consultant involved to redo feed budgets and look at it for next year. But you do need to have feed in the bag, so to speak, and, and average pasture cover on to do that. So I wouldn't suggest you do it without some forward um, budgeting and understanding what that's going to do to your feed budget, especially this year when we're so short of supplement. Totally agree. And I, I guess probably um, one other comment I'd have alongside that is just make sure you've got enough supplement for them to come back to come home mm. to. Um, there's always a temptation, as I'm sure a lot of people would um, uh, would um, confirm that that last bit of silage sitting in the pit or that mouldy stuff sitting out the back, there's always that temptation to get rid of it. But um, any last comments on just um, silage quality at the other end, Charlotte? Perhaps better to not yeah. feed that sort of material at the other end of the season? Yeah, it's that, that's that last line of baleage that you know might have been water damaged if you had a bit of flooding or whatever. But is, it, is that temptation to feed that to, to cows that come home um, and those that start the spring and haven't quite gone into the spring of mob? Whilst we're really desperate for feed this year, rotten silage, particularly if you open the first bale and it's that stuff that the smell gets into your hands, it smells a little bit like vomit and you can still smell it the following day after you've had even two showers. Um, that smell um, is butyrate or butyric acid. Um, that rotten vomit smell and if that's rotten 
if you feed that to heavily in calf late pregnant cows that are just close to springing, um, the, the, the um, butyric acid will butyrate in the rumen, passes over the rumen wall and goes into the blood. Um, and as it passes through the rumen wall, it's converted into uh, ketone bodies, specifically beta hydroxybutyrate. And hey, coincidentally, that's that stuff um, that cows produce themselves in their liver from when they're ketotic. So what you're doing is kind of injecting those cows with the instant ketones, ketosis, and you can increase metabolic disease. So whilst I know feed is really short this year, just tempting as it may be to feed that, that silage that you just haven't got to in the last two or three years because you know that it's not very good, just be careful. If you're going to feed it to something, well, don't feed it to something. But if you must feed it to something, don't feed it to heavily in calf cows. You will give them ketosis and suppress their appetite. And the irony is you give them ketosis from ketones coming from butyric acid in the silage, then they don't eat. So they make their own ketones. It's like a double hit, um, make ketones because because they're not eating enough. So mm, if in doubt, don't. Sorry Sean, to be I, I think we've covered an awful lot of information in a very short period of time. Um, I guess from our side of things, we do have some very good sources that people can go to. Um, they don't have to take all this in today. Any uh, comment on your social media post, um, bit of promotion around the room and room? Because a lot of yeah. this what we've covered today has been uh, covered in the room and room in recent times. Yeah, um, look, that's right, Wayne. And, and we make no apologies for the length of this post. And we normally keep these short and snappy. But, um, you know, even if you keep it on in the background and have, have a listen while you're doing the dishes or run around after kids or something. But, um, yeah, there is a lot of information we've covered today. And... Um, if you're more of a person that enjoys reading at your leisure than, than listening to us today, um, if you're not already a member of the group The Room and Room on Facebook, um, just search that up on Facebook and um, join in. We've got about four and a half thousand members in there and we've been quite busy in the last few weeks just posting quite a bit of information to support, try and support best we can some of the challenges you guys have been having. So there's been a three-part series on um, silage quality and baleage quality, how to how to analyse that, how to understand um, flood damage silage that was posted back in, in February after those unfortunate floods. And then just last week, we have put a, it's a very detailed post around transition feeding, um, stepping stock across from pasture onto crops, just as, as many of you are doing just now. Um, our shortened version, if you're not on Facebook, a shortened version of some of the stuff we've been putting on the Pleasure Your Rights and Seeds um, new initiative called Knowledge Base. Um, and you can access that with links off the PGG Rights and Seeds uh, Facebook page that obviously you've, you've come to see us today through that page. So just scroll down a bit further and you'll see some links through to, to Knowledge Base. And we're just starting to use that as a platform for those, I know Facebook isn't everybody's thing. So um, we will be uploading as much as we can from now on just to save you having to go on to Facebook. But apart from that, um, on behalf of Wayne and myself, we'd just like to say thanks very much for sitting through what's been a bit of an epic post, but hopefully uh, just a few snippets of those, um, if they make any, any difference to how you're doing your things, well, that'd be great. Love to get your comments. Uh, if you're watching this and um, after the live event, just, just bomb some comments on. Come across into the room and room if you want more in-depth, detailed discussions. Um, but Wayne and myself, we're ably supported by a big team. There's about 20 of us, hey, Wayne? And... Uh, yep. If we can't answer something, um, we've got real specialists in there that uh, can hopefully help out with any more detailed questions that you may have that Wayne and I haven't covered for you today. Thanks all, and enjoy the winter, and we'll see you at the other end. Sounds awesome. Keep up the good work, team. Cheers. <laughs>